Martin, the first question is for you. If the question for economists is not whether migration is good or bad, but how much is best, how do you work out the optimal level of migration? I'm not sure actually one can as an economist. The, um, because it, like, like all these questions, it depends on best for whom and best when mm -hmm. um, and how you weight these different benefits. It's pretty clear that migration is a very complex phenomenon. Migrants differ in the sort of people they are, why they've come, what skills they bring, what effect they will have on the economy and so forth. And home societies differ in their capacity and willingness to absorb them. And that will affect uh, what's the best. I think the, um, and you cannot avoid the fact that migration, and I argue this in my recent book, uh, The Crisis of Democratic Capitalism, differs from most other forms of, if you like, international economic exchange or movement in that it involves the movement of people and the movement of people mostly that is permanent. It changes the nature of a political community. And obviously, therefore, there is a political judgment to be had. My general view on the economics is that it is pretty clear that in general, migrants themselves have very large benefits from moving. And that is itself important. For the exporting societies, it's more complicated. It's really more complicated. Yes. Depends on remittances and so forth, the, who they are and so forth. And for the receiving societies, overall, the net narrow economic benefits look pretty small either way. They're not massive. But again, it depends very much on who they are, what they're for, what their contributions will be. I'd just like to add in one small point. It's often argued that the migration, which, which is, I think, definitively wrong, migration is the solution to the aging problem. You've got an aging society. But there's actually been quite a lot of work which is based on the pretty obvious point. If migrants come and stay, they age too. And the, so it doesn't actually affect the underlying problem. The aging process will continue. It's a temporary cessation but if you want to continue to receive immigrants to stop the aging of a society, the number of immigrants who have to accept is quite extraordinarily large. Catherine, you've researched the effect of EU migration on communities in Great Yarmouth, the town on the east coast of England, which had the fifth largest Brexit vote, with 70% voting to leave the EU. What are the strains uh, that contributed to that vote? It's really interesting. The um... The EU migrants who came to work in Great Yarmouth, they came in different phases, but large numbers of Portuguese migrants and then subsequently um, those from Eastern Europe, particularly from Lithuania and most recently Romania and Bulgaria. Uh, what's striking is that some of them, some of the, particularly the, those who came from Lithuania, started in low-skilled jobs with aspirations to do much higher-skilled jobs and they were doing, they came with often university degrees and masters. In the case of the Romanians and Bulgarians, they were generally very low skilled and often illiterate. And this, of course, made it very difficult for them to integrate into the local society. Uh, furthermore, um, Great Yarmouth has a terrible problem with housing, very poor conditions of its housing. Uh, it was very badly bombed in both the First and Second World War, and it also suffered terrible flooding. And so the, the housing stock itself is really very poor. And a lot of the old tourist buildings, which used to be in the heydays of uh, tourism to Great Yarmouth, there were heydays in the 19th century, um, have been turned into HMOs, houses of multiple occupation. And so there are large numbers of people crammed into small spaces. And they are essentially in certain parts of the town. And those parts of the town are seen by the locals as no-go areas. And if you look at the uh, uh, demographics of the town, probably maybe one in four of those living in the central town are EU migrant workers. They're working in chicken factories and in local farms. They work very long shifts, 12 hour shifts, and then they travel probably an hour and a half each way to get there. So when they get home, they're absolutely exhausted. And the last thing they want to do is to go out and socialize uh, with the local community. So you have a, a, a bifurcated community of locals and migrants who do not 
mix. And you see that even in the local cafes. There are lots of Portuguese cafes now. They're only for Portuguese nationals, only used by Portuguese nationals. And the problem has been a chronic underfunding of the public services. So there has been pressure on uh, GP services, pressure on the local hospital and pressure on local schools. And that had not been anticipated when free movement uh, was introduced. On Martin's point about dealing with an aging population, of course, with free movement, Often what you saw was that people came, so free movement under EU law, which for those of you who are not um, uh, uh, from Europe, you might know that there is a right of free movement, that people can move uh, and live and work in another member state. Uh, and of course, the UK was party to that until the UK left the EU. What we're seeing is that the UK government quite rightly gave what was called settled status to all of these EU migrant workers. Um, and of course, the EU did the same for UK workers um, living in European states. But the turning off of free movement has meant that the population becomes static and thus is aging. And we see that very much in Great Yarmouth. And so you have an aging population who've been doing some pretty grim jobs. And so their physical health is very poor. And so it does make your point in a very narrow way that actually having migrants who are here for the long term do not address the aging population. You could say, you know, we've had very high immigration and by the way, very high expansion of higher education in the last 15 years, and yet our economy has been stagnating. These two things are often put up by uh, liberal market economists as the solution to productivity and, and stagnation, and they haven't been, uh, certainly not in this period. Um, but what they have been, I think, is very dividing. I mean, if you just look back over the last 25 years, 1997, the uh, ethnic minority proportion of the population in the UK was somewhere between seven and eight percent. Mm -hmm. It's now 26 percent. I mean, there has been an extraordinary, I mean, Europe, I mean, Britain and much of the rest of Europe has become like America in this period. Um, but we are not America. You know, we were not, you know, we were not founded on, on an idea. We have not thought of ourselves historically as, you know, as, as countries of, of mass immigration in the way that America, you know, did for a long time. Um, and the, you know, leave aside, you know, the economics is neutral, you've got huge pressure on infrastructure, you've got, you know, very, very rapid change. Um, now, it is true, the recent numbers have been um, exceptionally high, and they're going to come down. There, there was a kind of post-COVID spike um, in student numbers. Um, there, of course, uh, we had the Ukraine and the Hong Kong numbers, so the humanitarian and refugee numbers went up, the numbers are going to come down. But I mean, the OBR is predicting the long term, I don't know, next couple of decades, average annual net immigration of around 300,000, 250 to 300,000. I think that is simply too high. So in your view, what's not working? Look, Leila, thanks for the question. I think it's the biggest issue here is the conflation between refugees and migrants. And just to illustrate that, you know, World Refugee Day falls on the 20th of June every year. So last year during World Refugee Day, there was an Ipsos survey carried out in 29 countries asking adults, about 20,000 20, adults in those countries, what would be their attitude if refugees or people fleeing persecution and violence and conflict in their homes should arrive on the shores of the countries of the, of the people surveyed. 74% of the populations in these 29 countries said, yes, these people had every right to enter the country and seek asylum. The UK was one amongst the countries that were surveyed and they were amongst the top three countries. 84% of the UK nationals who were surveyed basically said refugees should be granted asylum in the UK. So I think the problem is, and it's just as a, as a sort of anecdotal data, by the way, 70% of the world's 37 million refugees are actually living in countries neighboring their own. They're not heading towards the West or towards Europe or, or America, the United States. They're literally being provided shelter, food and, um, and basic services in countries neighboring their own. And 76% of these refugees are in low income countries or middle income countries, Pakistan, Iran, Colombia, Turkey, only one industrialized or developed economy is amongst the top five refugee hosting countries, and that's Germany. So this is really just to put things a bit in perspective. 
what we realize is that what people are concerned by, and this survey brought this out quite dramatically, is not so much about refugees entering their countries to seek asylum, it's the migrants who are now pretty much mixed in with the, the refugee populations entering the, uh, crossing the borders. And we know that mixed populations are now the new normal, that you're not going to have a predominantly refugee outflow influx or a predominantly migrant influx. It's now going to be a mixed populations that are trying to enter these countries. And what is happening is, of course, that the migrants amongst these populations trying to enter the uh, crossing to these countries choose the only option that they see available because absent legal, you know, labor mobility pathways or education pathways or other ways of entering countries legally, they take the only option available, which is the asylum system. And they go in there and, you know, we've seen the impact of that in the United Kingdom and other countries as well. They clog the system. The processes themselves are extremely long and time consuming and cumbersome, enabling these people to stay for extended periods of time. Now, I know that we UN folks have a ten reputation for sitting around admiring the problem, but in this instance, we actually have been providing solutions for this. We have been telling countries, all the countries, not just the, the destination ones, to adopt the whole of journey approach. So not to look at what's happening in the UK in isolation, but to look at it right from the point of departure of these people. So from the countries of origin, the countries of asylum, where the majority of the refugees were, through the transit countries like the North African ones or uh, you know the Central American countries when people are trying to get into the United States, all the way through to the countries of destination, which is essentially Western Europe and, and, and North America. And what we are basically saying is look at the countries of origin, invest enough in these countries to that you stabilize the population there so that they don't feel the need to move. But um, I think for us, really, this is essentially the focus that we really want to bring is it's not a refugee issue, it's really a migrant issue. And the conflation of the two, and unfortunately in this instance in the asylum processes, has really led to this perception that the 1951 convention is an obsolete instrument, that it's no longer valid in the contemporary world. And that's simply not true. What do you uh, think, uh, Catherine? The, um, the convention, which was drafted post-war, um, the Refugee Convention, um, was very much a product of its time, an admirable product of its time. But as we also know, the world has changed dramatically. Uh, effective um, communication, also um, uh, widely available, cheap, much cheaper flights, it's much easier for people to physically move, and also to get information about movement, which of course was not the case in the 1950s. Also, I think it was not perceived of as having this very intense uh, procedural dimension which we see now the asylum processing um, and so and of course there is an inherent tension that you have uh, large numbers of refugees but the, the refugee convention is focused on the individual and therefore of course that means to lawyers and quite rightly that each individual needs to be assessed individually and they've each got to be given a range of rights and this is the deep tension that you have with the um, refugee convention and how it has rolled out today and therefore the EU, the UK and other states have um, very detailed rules now which lawyers will check are being complied in each case which is why you get these different levels of appeal. Now what you're seeing um, happening is that um, the EU in particular has just negotiated after a long and tortuous process its migration pact um, which is primarily about uh, speeding up the initial process at the border, uh, also having safe third countries where there is a strong presumption, essentially, that individuals will not be entitled to claim asylum, so they will be subject to an accelerated procedure to um, return them quickly. Um, and, uh, and then also, um, although the EU has maintained its rule that you should be processed in the first safe country you come to, which puts huge pressures on Greece and the, the border states, mm. uh, what you have now is a much stronger solidarity mechanism, which is meant to be that uh, individuals, um, some individuals, proportionate share of individuals have moved to other member states to process. And if they are not processed and kept in those other states, those other states pay a 20,000 euro per head, essentially fine, 
um, if they refuse to take on their responsibilities. Now, of course, the reality means that because it's the pressure is still very much on um, processing people in the first safe country of the EU, which is largely Greece and Italy, those who are on the uh, geographical uh, periphery of the EU, uh, it's much easier for the northern states to, to um, hide behind the hands and say, well, that's their problem, it's not ours. Yes, they can pay. The question comes is what happens if they don't pay? And you can see that there will be countries which decide that they are thinking that paying for not taking people is not a good idea, deeply unpopular with the public. Although I don't actually think the Geneva Convention is really the problem. I mean, the, the problem is our, essentially our inability to control the flows. Reuven from the UNHCR sort of said that, um, that lots of people in rich countries are in favour of refugees. Well, we are kind of in principle, but you know, if you look at any uh, opinion poll on, say, you know, the boats crossing the channel, people are very worried about the lack of control uh, over numbers, over you know who's coming and so on. And the reason why it's so difficult for our countries to, to deal with these things is partly to do with our in internal liberalisation. I mean, uh, again, compared to the 1950s, individuals have far, far more rights of all kinds than they than they would have had then, uh, and therefore it's very difficult to deport people. Uh, it's also very difficult to deport people because there are the countries where probably 50, 60, 70 percent of the people are now coming from. We do not have returns agreements with. We do not have a returns agreement, mm -hmm. obviously, with China, Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, Eritrea. So what I'm proposing is that I mean I'm basically on the side of the European, I mean the British government, or and increasingly the European governments that are coming round to thinking. We have to stop irregular movement completely, and we have to offshore. So, you know, if, if, if people arrive, then they are taken to. You know, Rwanda may not work, but there are plenty of other places that, that might. Um, and you deal with their um, with their application there. And if they're successful, well, then they can stay in that safe place. There will be a small number who really would have, would classify under the old 1951 convention for example there was a mm. uh, an afghan woman judge who was in pakistan uh you know and, and there should be special you know like a special committee to let let people like that in but overall we need to put you know refugee stroke asylum migration on the same footing as legal migration i.e we select instead of it being a, a free-for-all you know, a survivor of the fit, fittest free for all, 90% young men from, from families that can afford to pay the ten or $15,000 to get here. Instead of that, we select the most vulnerable, as we did with the Syria regime. We had very good cooperation with the UNHCR. We brought in 20, 25,000 people, admittedly over a five-year period after 2015, and it worked really well. David presents a compelling argument, but what would, for example, the governments of Pakistan or Colombia or Iran say if you tell them you have 2.1 million Afghan refugees on your territory for the last 40 years, keep them there. We will come in and select the, you know, the best and the brightest amongst them and take them to our countries, but you keep the majority of the caseload. This is where the inequality is, and this is really an essential problem that we see. Externalization of the international obligations of the Refugee Convention. And we've been very vocal on this on the UK Rwanda Agreement, so I'm not going to go into that here. But that is very much that is essentially a, a very compelling problem that we are seeing. It shouldn't be either or, but also perhaps just to you know, I was talking about the whole of journey journey approach, and we have put that into practice in the Americas, where the United States, UNHCR, and IOM and others have invested in what are referred to as safe mobility offices in countries of transit where people are crossing through these countries to get to the United States. So these are countries like Guatemala, Costa Rica, Ecuador, and Colombia. We have established, along with IOM and the government's concern, these safe mobility offices where people, both refugees and migrants, can come. And these centers are essentially a one-stop shop. So if they are determined, found to be refugees, they would be resettled to the United States, to Spain and other countries. If they're found to be migrants, they, are may, they may be offered legal labor pathways to different countries in the region, including the United States, or if they're found to be not in need of international protection and are not interested in taking the migrant route, they would be, you know, their removal would be expedited. Now, this is in a very embryonic stage right now, but it is happening in these four countries. Can I segue into a question that many of you asked?
Uh, and that is the effect of climate change on migration patterns now and in the future. Um, Martin, would you like to enlighten us on that? The largest body of um, uh, um, relatively poor people in a region where the population is predictably going to grow very, very fast is in Africa, and where at least half the population growth over the next 30 years is forecast to occur. Um, and according to UN forecasts, for example, these are median forecasts, by um, 2060, a quarter of the world's population will be mm -hmm. in sub-Saharan Africa. And it's pretty clear that if climate change is really significant, there is a very high risk, or there's a high risk, as I understand it, I'm not an expert on climate, of an expansion of the desert, desert regions uh, of the continent, which are already highly unstable, um, where a lot of the Islamist terrorism and, and so forth is occurring. Um, so there must be a reasonably high probability that that will destabilize further polities, um, um, possibly including um, even more significant civil wars and so forth, and quite apart from economic failure. Those are the conditions, the combination of violence and economic failure uh, in, an, in, a, in an environment of poor economic performance, which are likely to generate re refugees and economic migrants. So it wouldn't seem very implausible that that will increase. And some will argue that this is going to be a more general condition, particularly as desert spread. There's a whole band across, across uh, the world. And um, this is, these are the regions in which most of the population growth is going to occur, basically, actually, South Asia and Africa. Right. So the, um, it doesn't look at the moment that India is going to be a huge problem, but we've already heard about Afghanistan and Pakistan. So it does seem to me reasonable that that will be a factor. And the main point, underlying point, is the distinction we make, which I understand, between economic migrants and refugees, quite apart from the fact that how they present themselves depends on how, what's going to work. But the basic point at the at the exporting end, um, well, these these blur, these merge. Economic conditions are closely related to what happens to polities and therefore political violence and all the rest of it and what happens to economic opportunity so they 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 are very very difficult to separate um prosperous stable democratic societies don't de generate huge numbers of economic or environment immigrants or refugees um so we have to imagine that if the world continues as it has been continuing in recent decades generating unstable states lots of mass violence and very poor economic opportunities for a lot of people and one of my most recent statistics shows the number of extremely poor poor people in the poorest countries of the world has actually stopped falling mm. altogether in the last 10 years then we're going to have more problems climate change is a risk multiplier for um, displacement as well i mean you know and i think martin mentioned the central sahel scarce resources, conflicts over those resources, generally along ethnic lines, driving people out of their homes and eventually out of their countries as well, they would qualify as refugees wherever they went. And so that's where UNHCR would step in and we would obviously consider them as being within a mandate. But also recalling that the vast majority of refugees are from climatically vulnerable countries and they're also being hosted in climatically vulnerable countries. And this is where there's an urgent need. Of course, we've seen this in, in most recent in COP28 in Dubai, where we were really pushing to include the whole issue of forced displacement in all of these somewhat grandiose declarations that are coming out, not to forget the fact that a significant proportion of the forces be displaced on the, in the world today are living in these countries that are vulnerable to climate change and require action speedily in order to stabilize these populations. I think this brings us neatly onto a question that many of you, like Eric Smith in the Netherlands or Charlie Mayfield in the UK have asked, how can we ensure the debate over immigration is informed 
rather than driven by politically motivated rhetoric. I'd like um, each of you to give me one piece of advice on that question. Reuven. It's information out there explaining the distinction between people fleeing persecution and violence and people who are just simply looking for economic opportunities elsewhere. I think that's a key. And as I said, going back to my initial comment on the Ipsos survey, refugees are welcome. That's abundant, made abundantly clear through that survey. What is not more concerning is the issue of economic migrants abusing the asylum systems to get into the country. Catherine, one piece of advice on how to get a better um, discussion about this that's actually more constructive like the one we've had today can i can i have uh, one and a half yes, one of is course. one is that um there is terrible confusion about terminology um uh the the language of illegal immigration asylum refugees economic migration all of it gets uh confused there are some very good websites out there if you want to know more but of course lots of people aren't going to spend their time trying to research it and therefore it's really important that you have as broad a spectrum of people and this is my uh, one point um, rather than the half about a clear information the one is there needs to be a very broad spectrum of people who are prepared to go out and talk about migration in as balance where as possible, because at the moment it seems to me that the debate is highly polarised on the left and on the right. And if you are trying to navigate a middle ground which recognises that uh, the doors cannot be open to all, but on the other hand we need to have a, a fair system, um, therefore there should be space for people to talk and express those views without being shouted down from the left as being intolerant and from being the right as uh, not recognising uh, the need of a Western society. And I think trying to reclaim that middle ground is going to become really important. And this will be the responsibility of politicians who, in whose interest is not to find a middle ground because uh, the highly charged rhetoric is very appealing to their narrow constituencies. But remember, of course, voters are a broad church and voters recognize that there are nuances but they need to be presented with a broad range of views, which we're not getting at the moment. Thank you. Martin? I have two reactions. I don't have an answer because I don't think there is an answer. I'm not at all persuaded that David has an answer, but I won't go into that. This is inherently political. There is no way on earth that the question of who lives in your country under what terms can be depoliticized that's essential. We can't, and we can't ignore that. And the second thing is the debate then has to be about practical steps to bring about and manage flows in such a way that they are politically tolerable, that they work, and are, in my view, reasonably civilized. Um, I don't believe the Rwanda scheme is. And um, can be clearly seen as beneficial to the country because I remain in the view, how could I not? I'm the child of refugees, that refugees can be rather useful. David. Um, I mean, as Martin says, this is inherently political and politics is inherently emotional too. And the fact that people are angered by the, the, ver the very visibility, the kind of, you know, almost the kind of insult of people getting on a boat from France and coming here and the national authority being able to do nothing about it, I think is very undermining to, to, you know, kind of attachment to democracy. And, you know, the famous saying that, you know, if the good politicians are not able to do something as apparently simple as stop that process, then people are going to vote for bad politicians.